Good morning and thank you for joining us today for the epidemiological summary. Teresa Marentet is not joining us today and uh, then the most recent case count can be seen on the right side of the or left side of the screen uh, um, um, uh, for the numbers. So we are reporting two new cases today um, and um, the rest of the details will come or cover in our uh, epidemiological summary. So just going right into our epi summary, um, these are the topics that we plan to cover. Uh, many of the topics we, uh, we have been uh, covering for some time, so if uh, uh, I may skip some slides just to, for the interest of time to make sure that we are touching on some of the key findings in many of these epidemiological summaries. So looking at the epidemic curve, epidemic curve help us to assess the progression of the disease, whether we are talking about a community in an outbreak situation or in, a, in any kind of cluster situation. This particular epi curve is created to show the number of confirmed cases by the date it was reported to public health. Uh, on your vertical axis, you are seeing uh, the number of uh, confirmed cases and your horizontal axis, we have the dates these cases are reported to public health. Uh, please note that these uh, cases report everyone, whether we are talking about the cases in the long-term care home, retirement home, agricultural farm sector, or community cases. As you can see, that there are a number of uh, ups and downs in this graph, uh, and a better way to look at it is uh, by you looking at a three-day moving average. The three-day moving average helps to uh, at least smoothen some of the day-to-day -day variation and try to paint a better picture of how things are going in the community. We can see that uh, we have seen a significant increase in uh, somewhere around mid of July and uh, that lasted almost end of July. And then more recently, we are seeing um, a relatively stable number of cases um, uh, in the region. Uh, looking at the cumulative cases and deaths since the first case was reported in Windsor, Essex and uh, new cases have remained low in the past and leading to a generalized stabilization of COVID-19 cases in, the, in, in Windsor, Essex. The easiest way to look at this graph is if the graph is uh, more steep, that means there are a high number of cases um, in, the, in the region in a short period of time and when you see the, the, the curve as more uh, flat, that means the number of new cases reported to our region is uh, relatively low uh, in, a sh in a short period of time. The number of case, uh, number of deaths uh, is uh, relatively uh, stable as well as we have seen um, uh, with, uh, with uh, most of these deaths reported in the elderly population. Looking at the, uh, the uh, breaking it down further to to look at uh, the cases with the agri farm sector with the non agri farm cases, uh, because significant portion of our cases, almost close to forty eight percent of our cases were in agri farm sector. Uh, so we, this graph is uh, created to show the difference if where these agri farm sector came into play versus the rest of the community. And more recently, what we can see is uh, the cases in the agri farm sector is pretty much uh, um, um, very low. And um, majority of the cases we are continuing to see in the community. Another way to look into uh, how we are doing is by looking at a seven day moving average to look at our overall trend. Uh, we have created two different lines One is a blue line that is looking at the cases using a seven day moving average and that includes all the cases. We see a peak in late March and April and then um, mainly it's, it's coming down uh, relatively. In the past month or so, our seven day moving average has remained low due to the low number of cases in the agri farm sector. And uh, the green line is created just to make that distinction if we remove the uh, agri-farm workers from our cases, what does it look like? You will notice that the seven-day moving average declines dramatically, uh, in, uh, especially in May and June, uh, when most of the cases we were seeing in agri-farm sector. But as we, are at the, as we are looking at the agri-farm sector, the cases are uh, pretty much non-existent. So th those two lines are combined together and are basically representing the entire community. Another way to look at it uh, is the week over week incidence raised per 100,000 population from week 18, which is the April 27th, to our current week, week 38. We saw a dramatic increase in cases from week 26 onwards, which are primarily attributed to the agri-farm sector, and now we are seeing a continued decrease as of week 38. Please note that week 38 is still in progress and ends on Sunday. 
this figure looks at all the tests and unique individuals tested by a week in Windsor, Essex, and this is a reflection of uh, the number of tests that's been conducted in the in the region. Um, there are uh, many questions that people sometimes ask that when we are looking at these uh, low number of cases, are we testing enough people? And the key question always goes back to we should be testing all these people who are um, who are uh, definitely symptomatic. Uh, all of those individuals need to be tested. There are other high risk criteria, high risk groups that are mentioned that should be tested. Uh, overall, when we are looking, in total, 94,188 tests, roughly 95,000 tests were completed with uh, at least using 58,000 unique individuals uh, since uh, as of uh, September 12th. Looking at all the cases, our current person positivity is 1%, which is represented in the green line in this graph. And last week, approximately 700 tests were completed daily. Our overall person positivity since the beginning of pandemic is 2.9%, and the uh, majority of that was seen in the beginning and the mid part of the pandemic in our region. We, we used to show this graph in terms of percentage of test results available within one day, and uh, I, this is a new slide uh, that we didn't show for a couple of weeks. Uh, this particular graph looks at the percentage of test results that are available within one day of someone getting tested. Uh, what we can see, uh, which is uh, highlighted in the red box here, is the, the number of test results rece being received within one day is going down. So uh, basically that's, to, that's telling that uh, the, the turnaround time is increasing in, uh, in our region for getting a positive test result. Um, so looking at the regional and provincial rates, uh, Windsor Essex continues to have the highest rate in the province and our rates are higher than the, uh, the many other uh, uh, densely populated region in, in Ontario. For us here locally, obviously we have experienced a significant high proportion of cases in the agri-farm sector. Uh, roughly um, at, at its peak, uh, majority of the cases were from the agri-farm sector. Right now, they're standing at 45% of our overall case count uh, in the region. Looking at the case rates per 100,000 by municipality, uh, we can clearly see that Leamington and Kingsville continue to have the highest rate and, uh, major like, and mainly just because of the agri-farm sector. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, majority of the farm workers living in those two municipalities. Looking at map of the confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Windsor, Essex, and uh, basically this map displays the rate per 1,000 resident by dissemination area. And the areas with no colors are places where there have been no any lab confirmed cases, uh, for example, tested and diagnosed. The scale that is used is ranged from 0 0.5 cases per 1,000 to 368.2 cases per 1,000. And the scale will change in each map and is a relative comparison to the cases in each geographical distribution. As you can tell from the previous slide, in Leamington and Kingsville, the darker colors, blue and purple, indicates higher cases of these specific dissemination areas. Relative to the county, rates are low in the city of Windsor. A yellow or lighter version of yellow indicates low rates of COVID in these specific areas. Please note that this does not mean that these are the cases where, in, where infection happened. Rather, this is an indication of where these people, where these cases live. Cases may have been exposed outside to the to their home area and in any other type of settings. Zooming in to the city of Windsor map uh, by rate per 1,000 uh, residents, once again, areas with no color are where no lab confirmed cases were identified. This map is uh, the incidence rate range from 0 0.8 cases per 1,000 to 47 cases per 1,000 population. Focusing just on the active cases uh, that the health unit is tracking per 1,000 uh, population, the active cases are distributed po in pockets across Windsor and Essex, and low rates are generally observed. Zooming in on uh, uh, Windsor, um, and this is what we, are, we can see, majority of the cases are still, there are some pockets, but uh, we have seen uh, some activity in the South Windsor area. Here we look at the overall cases by age and sex and what looks like in the past two weeks. Overall, we have seen more male cases compared to females, but this number is disproportionately high, higher in females within the past two weeks. 
Uh, we have seen a large number of children between 0 to 19 who contracted COVID-19 in the past two weeks, along with younger adults between 20 to 29 years of age, compared to what we have seen overall since the beginning of this pandemic. So there is a shift that uh, younger people in our region are now um, uh, getting more of these cases. This looks at the overall cases in Windsor Essex by each of the municipality, and no surprises there. Uh, overall, uh, the highest number of cases reported in Windsor, Leamington, and Kingswell, and uh, the rest of the municipalities have a relatively lower number of cases spread uh, in their region. Uh, looking at the cases over the past 30 days, uh, what we can see is 47% of the cases are from Windsor and 28% from Leamington and 7% from LaSalle, while the other municipalities uh, added a uh, minimum the number of uh, cases uh, in the region. Zooming in further in the last seven days, uh, City of Windsor again uh, came uh, out to be the, uh, the, uh, where most of these cases happened, uh, while the rest of the municipalities uh, uh, showed a relatively stable number of cases with no uh, no real spike uh, in any in any particular municipality. So this graph uh, just represents the epidemic curve by reported date uh, for the city of Windsor, where we have seen most of the cases. What we can see is the community seven-day moving average, a, a slight uptick in the recent uh, weeks, uh, something to uh, to be mindful of and. Uh, uh, some of those cases are linked with the community clusters that we have reported, hoping that uh, these numbers will go down to uh, relatively stable in, in the next uh, couple of weeks. Looking at Amherstburg, uh, very few cases, and uh, this is what the, the epidemic curve looks like for uh, Amherstburg. This is what it looks like for Essex, which has seen uh, slightly more cases compared to, uh, uh, compared to Amherstburg. This is for Kingsville. We have seen a large number of cases in Kingsville, especially in uh, June, July, and uh, early August. But since then, the cases uh, have gone down uh, drastically with uh, very few cases as, we, uh, as of um, uh, the last couple of days. Looking at Leamington, similar picture, uh, a significant activity June, early July, mid July, and then uh, relatively stable, trending downwards uh, at the, at the, in the more recent days. Uh, Lakeshore, I've seen some, some, uh, some activity, but overall the, the number of confirmed cases count continue to be, uh, remain uh, relatively low. LaSalle, similar picture, uh, not much activity. We have seen some activity late August. Uh, which is now uh, trending downwards and stabilizing. Similar picture in Tricumsi, uh, no real increase in number of cases, relatively few number of cases, um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, we've seen some cases uh, coming from Tecumseh, uh, something to be, uh, to be mindful of. Uh, this is where we're looking at how these cases are acquired uh, COVID. Uh, we see that early on it was imported to Windsor Essex via travel. From then we saw uh, some cases in community spread, but predominantly spread through close contact. And then close contact spread includes outbreak institution like out, uh, long-term care home, retirement home. And close contacts also includes uh, predominantly agri-farm sector as well. More recently, what we're seeing is uh, more and more of these cases are tied to the close contact, which is good from a public health containment perspective. That means we are getting all the information about people who are uh, potentially at risk of developing COVID and uh, spreading it to others. So we are uh, getting um, in touch with all of them, but we are still seeing some community transmission, which I think we need to be very mindful of and uh, need to uh, make sure that we are not contributing to any community spread. If you have symptoms, if you're suspected of COVID, if you have a high risk exposure, uh, you can go and get tested to make sure that uh, you're not putting anyone at risk. Looking at the hospitalization and ICU rates for COVID-19, as we can see that we have seen some spikes uh, um, um, in the cases in hospitalization. But more recently, in the last couple of weeks, we have seen a decline, uh, a trend downwards in the hospitalization beds occupied with uh, COVID and including ICU beds, um, and which is a good sign uh, from, our, from uh, the COVID perspective. Overall, as a system, uh, we continue to see uh, more um, uh, occupancy in acute care beds. 
uh, which is above 85 uh, percent uh, and generally that's the threshold that's used to to have uh, some buffer in case if there's a surge in COVID-19 cases in our community. Uh, the green line um, and dark blue lines are ICU capacity and ICU vent ventilator beds and uh, overall there is no set standards or threshold to monitor that but what we can see is the number of uh, ICU beds occupied uh, is, uh, is, uh, is trending upwards um, and uh, in the, in the last couple of weeks, but now uh, showing some signs of decline, which uh, is not COVID-related because COVID-related ICU beds uh, utilization are pretty much non-existent at this time. Overall, looking at the outcomes, uh, the good news is uh, almost 94% uh, of the cases in our community is resolved. Uh, we lost 3%, uh, roughly 3% of our cases uh, to COVID in our region. And then uh, we have uh, uh, at least 3.4% of our population uh, is uh, continuing to self-isolate. This number uh, is, or this percentage has increased from the last week, and it just is a function of uh, how many people are currently active at this time. Um, and once they are discharged, these numbers continue to go down. Among those who lost their life uh, as a result of uh, COVID, um, what uh, we can see is uh, the majority of the, them are females and uh, the highest age group that you can see is uh, um, uh, majority of the people who died uh, were uh, 80 years and older. Uh, while we had our uh, youngest death in our region uh, was a gentleman in his 20s. Overall, looking at the case fatality rate in Windsor, Essex, we continue to have uh, um, um, a low case fatality rate compared to the provincial average. Um, and a uh, similar picture in the long-term care home, we continue to have low case fatality rate uh, in our region compared to the provincial average, which is a good sign in terms of uh, the, uh, the health system uh, response and uh, overall our ability to, uh, to manage our uh, sick patients in our region. Looking at the day-to-day -day doubling time in our region, as we can see, we have seen significant up and down trend in, in our area, but what we are more recently seeing is we continue to stay above the provincial average. And in this particular graph, if you are above the provincial average, that means you're doing good. If you are below the provincial average, that means you're doing poor, and that means uh, your cases are increasing at a rapid pace compared to the provincial average. So if it's our cases are increasing at a higher, uh, sorry, uh, if our doubling time is at a higher, uh, then the provincial average that means it's taking to, uh, longer for our case to double compared to the provincial average uh, we have seen some increased uh, activity in uh, in specific areas of the province and as a result that's driving that number or average down day-to-day -day doubling time down for the province but for our region we we are still above the provincial average but we are seeing a downward trend um, uh, as well in our re in our area And the most recent uh, estimated uh, mean R0 is um, uh, effective R0 is 0 0.31. And when the R0 is less than one, that means every infection causing less than one new infection, signaling a decrease in the virus transmission in the community. When the R0 is greater than one, uh, each existing infection is causing more than one new infection. And if uh, the, uh, in our region, our R0 estimate very greatly due to the influx of cases from the agri-farm sector, but more recently we are seeing a decline of overall across Windsor Essex, and the shaded area demonstrates the variation that we can be, that we see. So in summary, uh, Windsor Essex is seeing low cases overall. Uh, the primary source of exposure continues to be a close contact with a confirmed case, which is a good sign overall from the uh, Windsor Essex case count perspective that we are seeing some increase in other areas. We have seen some pockets of cases, we have seen some clusters in our community that we were able to track down and able to follow up from a disease containment perspective uh, and potentially prevented uh, other cases resulting from those uh, investigation. COVID-19 related hospitalization and ICU occupancy is low, showing a, a better response from the healthcare system partners uh, in containing the virus and uh, not getting to any complications associated with, uh, with COVID-19 in the region. Our not effective value is currently at 0 0.31, which is indicating a decrease in the transmission activity in Windsor-Essex. And I hope that despite all those challenges that other regions are seeing, 
are continue, uh, we can we should see a relatively uh, lower, uh, almost uh, non-existent cases in our community. And this can only happen when all of us work together and keep doing what we are doing. And I know it, I sound, sound like a broken record, but uh, I cannot emphasize it more that now is the time we can take charge of our destiny, what would happen in the next couple of months. In our region, it's all up to us and all of us need to work together to keep the numbers at this level, which would be beneficial for our economy, for our social well-being, for our mental well-being, and everyone's uh, interest to keep those numbers low. Thank you. The conference is now unmuted. We'll now take questions from the media. We'll start with Blackburn. I'm going to pass this round. Okay, we'll start with Windsor Star. Uh, no questions. Uh, Windsor, right? Uh, good morning, Dr. Ahmed. With the R9 0.31, uh, from that graph, that looks like it's the best uh, we've ever had uh, for the R0 uh, so far. Does that, uh, is that primarily because there's a lack of community spread and it's mostly close to contact? Um, well, R0 is uh, dependent on uh, how many cases and infections are causing. So basically, let's say if you have a high number of cases, and again, uh, it's uh, let's say if you have active cases at this time, 1,000 cases, and then what those 1,000 cases did not resulted in, let's say, another 1,000 cases, and they resulted only in a lower number of cases. So the transmission is is happening even either through a close contact or through a community transmission. So that means the transmission is happening. So it's not necessarily linked with the close contact per se. It's just resulting from you had a high number of cases. And if those high number of cases are resulting in lower number of cases, that's where the R0 is trending down because then eventually those low number of cases will continue to result if they move in this direction, that there is limited transmission. So whatever cases you had the second time, you expect to see the third round further decline in the number of cases and potentially leading all the way down to zero. So I don't uh, necessarily think that um, it has to do with the close contact. It has to just do with the uh, transmission and the spread in the community. And uh, to these two cases, do you have the uh, information about those with a close contact or still under investigation? So one person is a close contact and the other person is still under investigation. Any questions from CBC? Uh, not right now, thank you. Any questions from AM800? Dr. Ahmed, I just want to get your thoughts on uh, the University of Windsor announcing their winter semester will be online similar to their fall. We see what's happening in London at Western. Uh, do you believe this is the right move? Uh, were you involved in this process? Well, I think I, I cannot uh, say that uh, whether it would be a right move or a wrong move. I think it's just uh, uh, the organizations or the agencies, uh, they are in a much better position to, uh, to assess their own ability to respond and to have all those systems in place. And uh, looking at uh, the potential spread, um, uh, we know whether there are a number of options that people can choose, whether they can uh, they want to uh, study uh, from home or whether they want to do online classes, in-person classes. So there are a number of these options that are available. So I think the reality is goes back to um, even just like, as I said back, uh, it, um, I guess, a few weeks ago that uh, it's up to the parents how they want to choose that, whether they want to. Uh, would they want their child to do online lessons versus uh, in-person lessons? So I think as an institution, there is uh, uh, there are some activities that are happening, especially uh, looking at the example of Western. Um, and uh, the universities are in the best position to make a decision whether they feel that uh, um, they can provide that online uh, education versus providing that in uh, in-person uh, in education. So it's really up to them and I wouldn't fault them from uh, making one decision versus other. Still clear college students return uh, back to campus on Monday. What is your message to college students so we don't see what's happening in London here? Yeah, well, similar messaging that we are we're talking about it in the in the community as well. Reduce the number of your close contacts, and I think that's the key piece. Is uh, people are forgetting that uh, um, it's yes, they are all your close friends. We get it. 
we all have number of friends but the problem is the more close contacts you have the higher you are at risk of contracting COVID-19 because it, it takes only one person and, and in some of these settings in close quarters in close uh, environment uh, it can spread very quickly so it's just uh, my message to them would be you know uh, doing your part in understanding um, how COVID spread and uh, ensuring that you're physically distancing yourself you're washing your hands frequently and more often, and you're wearing a, a facial cl a cloth mask uh, uh, in areas where you cannot maintain your physical distancing and reducing the number of close contacts. I think I cannot emphasize this more, reducing the number of close contacts. That will be the best way that you can do to protect yourself. And finally, I'm not sure if students from out of town are still coming down here for college, but those students are basically leaving their social circle to come to get their education, which is great, but would that mean they have to start a new social circle? Well, I think uh, um, um, they, uh, you know, you can, you can basically, uh, let's say, and again, I don't want people to start thinking in that direction, but uh, basically 14 days, anyone who is self-isolating, so basically they have broken that previous contact with, uh, with the other group. And if you want to create a new group and if you are getting in, in let's say, uh, in uh, a new roommate in these type of uh, college or uh, university setting. Um, and uh, if you are true to your social circle or household contact number, uh, you can still be OK because then you basically you cut off your previous connection and then you build some new connection. So you have to be creative and you have to be smart about it that how many close people that you are interacting with. And uh, based on what we know about COVID, if I am, I didn't meet anyone in the last 14 days and now I am meeting at, let's say, two or three new people that are now in my close friend circle, that's okay because now it's the number has changed. I'm not going back and forth because I basically severed all those uh, connections for uh, at least a short period of time to, um, because I realized that I have to be in close contacts or these two or three new people will be my new household contacts. So I think it's just making that distinction. Thank you. Any further questions from Blackburn? Just to clarify, Dr. Ahmed, are you suggesting that out of town students self-isolate for two weeks before perhaps they intermingle with their new roommates or how would that work? Well, university have their own policies and procedures about that. And uh, I think uh, it's uh, what I was telling. It's it's just basically focusing on the your close contact piece that how you can close contacts or how you should how you should uh, uh, get those close contacts um, anywhere in the province. So if people are moving from one area to another within the province of Ontario, there is no restriction. There is no requirement from anyone. But I think in the best interest, if you're seeing that, uh, yeah, you may have been exposed or you, there may be uh, new circles that you are uh, contemplating to join, I think it's always a good idea to uh, to put yourself uh, for uh, away and uh, um, practically self-isolate yourself uh, for, uh, for 14 days before you get in touch with the other people. But again, this is not a requirement. This is just more of a, you know, a suggestion for people who are thinking about uh, being more proactive and uh, more responsible in taking some of those measures. The other question I have for you is about uh, the uh, orders that have gone out to businesses, uh, orders that have gone out to people who weren't uh, following the quarantine. Has the health unit laid any fines in regards to those, or is it still no? Uh, no, there's still no, because as I said, uh, most people uh, complied uh, when uh, when we were there, and uh, Teresa touched on many of these uh, business enforcement pieces, but from the personal or community enforcement perspective, um, we, we get immediate compliance when uh, those orders were issued. Thank you. Any further questions from the Windsor Star? No, thank you. Windsor 8? No, thanks. CBC? No, thank you. AMA 100? No, thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.